what he said. I'm DB. Nice to meet you. Cool. Okay, just a little bit of a primer. Um, my electric prosthetic hands, you basically look at the muscle activity coming from someone's residual limb, you run it through some sort of controller and convert it into the motion of prosthetic hand, right? Um, typically, my electric prosthetic hands are done with discrete controls, so you're trying to recognize some sort of pattern of muscle activity and convert it to a discrete motion. That's the primer. We, you'll have seen a lot of like machine learning based prosthetic hand controllers and they produce very sophisticated results that look very nice and flashy, but in reality they kind of follow two trends. The first is that they require large amounts of training data and what that translates to for the, for the user is that the user is going to have to record the same motion over and over again. Uh, this can take time and also can cause phantom limb pain. The other is that they have a large number of model parameters, particularly those that look at training a model on a large population of people then transferring it onto a user that requires a, a model that is an order of magnitude or two larger than what we would need for just a personalized model. So all in all, this makes them unsuitable for regular calibration and use. And what we want to know is, can we develop a controller that uses minimal user data that is suitable for fast calibration? OK, so what I'm going to talk about, we've done the motivation, tick. Now we're going to look at the controller and something I'm calling the three eyes, which is sort of the intu intuition behind it, how we mathematically implement it, and then how we integrate it into an actual prosthetic hand controller. Then we'll go over the experiments we performed, which is building a reference library, testing the controller accuracy, and then validating it on real-world tasks. Then we'll have some conclusions. Then we'll have some questions. Then maybe we'll get a coffee or something, I don't know. <laughs> cool. So the intuition behind it is we have some sort of EMG signal coming in that looks like that on the, on the right. Right? Nice. Um, <laughs> this is sampled equally spaced electrodes around the forearm. So this is going to be important. Keep that in your brain. We're going to keep hold of that. We've got a set of reference muscle activities. So pre-hand, we've sat there and we've recorded actions that we might want to use in control later on. And then we have this incoming live muscle activity. We want to know, instead of having some sort of classifier, some sort of model that's really complicated, can we just directly compare what's going on now and measure like how far away it is from each of these references? And I'm just going to tell you, we're going to use the spatial relationship of these EMG signals to help us along the way. So what we're going to do is first we're going to transform the signals to a space where we can compare them easily. Then we're going to use the spatial properties of the signals and obtain sort of an estimate of the distribution that produced them. Then we're going to use that distribution uh, to calculate a distance metric between what the EMG we're seeing now and the EMG we've got in the reference. Great. Cool. On to the uh, implementation. We, just, we take a snapshot, so a 0 0.1 second rolling window of EMG signals. So that's all we need. It's not like 10 hours of data. It's just 0 0.1 seconds of data. We say they exist in a cylindrical plane, and you might think, whoa, that's crazy, but don't worry. <laughs> around the, the wrap dimension is the circumferential position around the forearm. So as we said, we're sampling equally spaced around those. And then in the linear dimension, we have signal intensity, which looks like that. <laughs> cool. And then all together, it looks something like this. Here's a nice video. Audible gasps. <laughs> cool. OK, so now we've got these in a nice space that we can do some stuff with. Um, what we want to do is estimate a distribution that produced them. We're using kernel density estimation. I'm not going to go into the maths behind it, but we used a, a kernel that wraps in one dimension, so around the arm, and then is limited by the sensor value, so it's truncated in the other dimension. Produces something that looks like this. As you can see, oh, laser pointer. Okay. You see how it wraps up here, down to there. Yeah, nice. Sweet. Cool. Okay. So now that we've got this, and say that we've got your estimated distribution of incoming signals, and then you have your library of ones you've pre-recorded, we want to know, can we compute a distance between them? And if so, can we then use that for classification of what's actually going on? So the way we do this is using the Wasserstein distance. It's more maths. I'm not going to do it. Check the paper or a video online um, that we've got put up. Would recommend. Um, but essentially what we do is we resample from the kernel density estimates. We take points on, from the one that's coming in and something on our reference library. Then we use something called sync divergences to approximate the Wasserstein distance with a cylindrical distance metric, which is a lot of words to say we compute some sort of distance between them. Um, it's an optimization problem. It's mathematically quite intense, but there are ways to speed it up with these divergences. Cool. Um, the way that we integrate this into a prosthetic hand controller is we have our live EMG distribution here. We have a series of references. We do the line thing. Uh, we compute the distance, and then we repeat that for all of them, and then we can select the one that's closest, that falls below a threshold, and we basically say, okay, your EMG is close enough to this reference, you must be wanting to do that, hopefully. The way this then translates to a motion of the hand is we whatever reference muscle activity you had corresponds to a reference motion, and we select that as what we want to do. Okay, so in summary of the controller, 
We take a 0.1 second snapshot of EMG data. It's very short, there's not much data at all. We only use a single snapshot for each reference. This means we get almost instant calibration and recording. So if we want to calibrate it, we just, we just do each action once, press record, like take a screenshot basically of that, and then we're done. There are some added bonuses to all of this. Because we have the distance, we can actually look at the distance between references. So say when you're recording, acti when you're recording um, actions for your library, we can look at them and go, oh, that one's too close to this. Like your tripod grasp is a bit close to your pinch grasp. You might need to change how you do that. It's useful for uh, rehabilitation purposes. And it gives us greater interpretability of control. So if something's going wrong, we can just sort of go, hey, uh, are you were doing your, I don't know, your pronation look, is looking a bit too supinate or something like that. <laughs> So, uh, onto experiments. The first one was building a reference library. So we asked the users to uh, record 11 common actions, um, which fall into various categories of hand motion. Then we compute the interreference distances. I'm going to blast through this bit because it's kind of boring. Um, <laughs> uh, so first, we select the reference with largest average distance to the others. Uh, then iteratively, we add more and more references, and we can imagine as you add more, they get closer together, and then it gets harder to tell them apart. So we want to see what happens here. Um, we repeat that, build up a big library. So we did this for one disabled and 10 non-disabled participants, and we found that they can produce up to nine, which is there, nine distinguished references. And we found that for the disabled participants' references are significantly closer together. And this is generally to do with, say, muscle weakness, if they don't use a prosthetic hand, or muscle heterogeneity post-amputation, which is pretty common. And we'll see more of that later. Um, so the next experiment was to record six, ref six references for non-disabled participants. We recorded them congruent to the desired motion of prosthetic hands, so like open, close, pronate, supinate, uh, I think a tripod grip as well. For the disabled participant, as we said, sometimes these common actions don't translate well across, so we got them to do non-congruent actions to achieve distinguishable references, which was supinate, pronate, power grip, and then thumb opposition, which is interesting enough, I'll be happy to talk about that later, and then pinky flexion. We got them to repeat it 10 times in random order, and we allowed them up to two recalibrations. And then we computed the accuracy of the controller. So for non-disabled participants, we got about 90%, which tripod grip was in the most false positives because it's kind of a mixture between flexion of those fingers and extension of the others. And then for the disabled participant, we got an accuracy of about 87%, with rest causing the most false positives just due to what, muscle weakness. Now, most people would stop there and call that a day because that would be a cool, good result. We thought, no, let's check this in real life and see how good this is. Uh, so we used the Olympic hands, would recommend. Great hands, built by us in the lab. We tested it on the, real, on the Jefferson Taylor hand function test, which has a bunch of uh, ADL-like tasks. And it looks something like this. So we got the disabled participant to use their body power prosthesis, same person using the Olympic hand, and the non-disabled participant, uh, we had 10 of those using the Olympic hand. Uh, this is them picking up small objects, so two paper clips, two uh, bottle caps, and two pennies. And then lifting large, heavy objects as just example videos. Quite nice. You might notice that the disabled participants are really fast. And they are. They're much, much better than anything we did. So we went home and looked in the mirror for a couple of days, <laughs> screamed into the void, and then started analyzing. So, caveat, all participants were able to compete every task, which is good. However, the body power prosthesis outperformed the Olympic hand on every single task, and we've analyzed it, and we reckon it's down to about four factors. The first one being user expertise, which is sort of um, what skills they can transfer from their body power prosthesis to the Olympic hand. Um, classifier latency, which is how long it takes to classify a pattern of muscle activity. Motion latency, which is how long it takes for the hand to actually execute its motion. And then mechanical features of the hand, which inherently limit how it's going to perform. So the first one is um, user expertise. So uh, particularly in tasks, which was writing and feeding, you have to hold the object in the static grip. Uh, that's easily transferred from a body power prosthesis to the Olympic hand, so the disabled participant performed better in this, which is these sort of inner lines there. Uh, so they performed better than non-disabled participants, which is pretty interesting. For objects where the object is large, motion, the time taken to actually execute the motion is, is pretty low. So in this case, classify latency, so this is the time taken for us to actually recognize what you want to do and start doing the action, that dominates this sort of increase in time. For small items, such as picking up the paper clips or stacking checkers is J5, um, motion latency is a big contribution, and that's because the hand has to move all the way from open to close. And if you miss that grasp, you have to do it all over again, and it takes, it takes a couple of seconds. That's an inherent limitation of discrete control methods. And then finally, the mechanical features of uh, the Olympic hand uh, have a big impact. The Olympic hand has underactuated fingers, which means that if you 
prematurely contact anything or if you mistime it, they won't close in the same way and you won't achieve that pinch grasp of small items. So we have a little bit of, um, well, we have a lot of that going on here. Uh, and that's something we observed as a big thing. So in summary, discrete control was achieved with minimal user data and we got calibration down to under a minute. We validated it technically on real world tasks and saw that body powered is much, much better and we have a long way to go. Uh, however, we identified key performance factors and they are going to influence future work heavily and that will be mainly around reducing motion, la motion latency and improving mechanical features of the Olympic hand. Quick shout out to my funders. Thanks for the money. Um, and thanks to the great, amazing charity, the Alex Lewis Trust. I really recommend you check them out because they're great, doing great work and Koala also doing great work as a company. Thank you. <laughs>